Well, Trump administration officials today again blame China for the global pandemic. But there is a growing belief that the COVID-19 virus originated in the Wuhan lab. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post. COVID-19 has the world's two most powerful countries, the USA and China, staring each other down. So far, it's been a war of words and sound bites, a blame game over the origins of the pandemic and each side's response to it, conducted mostly through the news media. The Chinese and American media industries are ideological opposites. One operates under the watch of Communist Party censors, the other under a capitalist free market dominated by a handful of mega conglomerates. But news outlets in both countries have found their own ways to bolster the talking points of their respective governments. Later in this program, we'll hear from a Chinese news anchor on the role of journalism in this soft power conflict. But first, The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi on how the pandemic has been covered on each side of the Sino-American news divide. A Chinese doctor who had been scolded in his own country for sounding an early warning about coronavirus has died. In the media ecosystems of the United States and China, a war of competing COVID-19 narratives is underway. Stories of the pandemic have taken on radically different meanings, few more so than the case of Dr. Li Wenliang. Let's start with the facts. On December 30th, 2019, Li Wenliang, a doctor at Wuhan Central Hospital, warned a group of his colleagues on WeChat, the messaging app, about an outbreak of a strange pneumonia-like virus. Screenshots of Li's messages soon leaked out of the chat group onto the open internet. And on January 3rd, local police called him in for questioning. They got him to sign a confession, admitting to making, quote, false comments. And when Li died one month later from the very virus he had been warning of, Beijing had a problem on its hands. I was in Wuhan throughout that period when Li Wenliang emerged as a public figure and then died. and. Um, to live through that time and to see how people responded across China was truly extraordinary. It was this tremendous eruption of emotion and feeling and sympathy. It also immediately attracted the attention of domestic um, commercial news media. So the authority then realized that not only the police made a huge mistake reprimanding him, also, there is a danger that Li Wenliang would then become a martyr. China's state media did not shy away from the martyr label. They made it their own, shifting the narrative from criticism of Beijing to eulogies for Dr. Li. To hear the US media tell it, Li was the heroic whistleblower who defied an authoritarian, communist government. And his story fit tidily into an emerging wider narrative of a Chinese cover-up. But if action had been taken when he and others started sounding alarms, the severity of the outbreak might have been understood sooner. It's a tempting theory. The truth, however, is more complicated. Several days before Li Wenliang had alerted his colleagues, another Wuhan doctor, Zhang Jixian, was sounding the alarm via official state-approved channels. Her warnings went up the chain. She was not reprimanded. And on December 31st, four days before Dr. Li signed his confession, China alerted the World Health Organization to a dangerous unknown virus. Within 24 hours of that, the United States government was also informed. Vijay, you've argued that in reporting on China's handling of the coronavirus, U.S. news outlets have taken a selective approach on which facts and which stories matter. Can you talk about that in the context of the cases of these two doctors? These two stories side by side show that there's two things happening in China at the same time. 
And what's stunning is that the Western media ignores Dr. Jiang's timeline and they focus on Dr. Lee's timeline because it's a reprimand. And a reprimand means suppression. The virus grew to a pandemic because Chinese officials silenced health authorities in that country who tried to warn the public about it. The reprimand of Dr. Lee took place on the 3rd of January. The World Health Organization was informed on the 31st of December 2019. It's a very curious suppression when somebody is reprimanded after you've already told the international body about what's happening. Journalists do have good reason to be suspicious of the Chinese authorities. In 2003, China initially covered up the SARS epidemic, so there was a track record there. On COVID-19, a number of American outlets have reported on failings at different levels of the Chinese bureaucracy. As the virus spread, a consensus emerged. Voices from American news studios and opinion pages saying that the communist authoritarian system was a root cause of this pandemic. For reporters closer to the story, though, there was more to it. Chris, you've worked as a journalist in China for more than two decades. You reported China's COVID-19 response for The New York Times. What do you make of this notion of a systematic cover-up orchestrated by Beijing? Well, it's one of those accusations which, uh, when you look at the evidence, is actually a much more complex process. The weight of the evidence suggests that uh, there were problems of communication within the Chinese government. And I think it's probably true that health officials in Beijing were trying to figure out just how contagious this virus was. So in other words, I don't think it's the case that from the very beginning, the central leadership in Beijing had a full understanding of what was happening in Wuhan. The Chinese government did panic when this unfamiliar virus was first discovered. They didn't have a solid plan. However, they soon realized how dangerous it was and quickly changed strategy. So just 20 days after decoding the virus, the government decisively put Wuhan, a city with a population of more than 10 million people, under lockdown. I'm not sure any Western government could have acted with such resolute force. In the initial stages of the outbreak, early January, there was a brief burst of critical journalism in China. But as Beijing went into crisis mode, that window soon closed. On February the 4th, China's Central Propaganda Department did something few governments could pull off. They sent hundreds of reporters into Wuhan to cover the government's response. In the Chinese political system, the media um, very much plays this kind of mediating role between the population and the government, in the sense that the media should be the mouthpiece of the government in propagating policy to the public. The assumption is that in a Marxist-Leninist state, the media should educate themselves constantly by going to the public to understand what are the issues um, of the common population so that the media can also reflect this to those who are in power. Chinese state media has done what it often does, which is to portray other countries as chaotic, as dangerous, as not as well governed as China. They have especially focused on the U.S. pointing a finger at uh, senior government officials who they accuse of having a Cold War mentality and really um, putting the onus of the deterioration in bilateral relations on the U.S. side. Because we can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. Hostility towards China has been a running theme of Donald Trump's presidency. And as the virus began to rip through the United States, Trump went on the offensive with an incendiary allegation that COVID-19 had originated in a laboratory in Wuhan. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence 
that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Trump has offered no evidence to support that claim, which numerous experts have dismissed. The theory's origin, however, lies not with the president, but with the press. In late January, the Washington Times, an ultra-conservative fringe paper, published this dubious article. The story was mostly ignored, and two months later, the Times added an editorial note, saying that scientists saw no signs that the virus had been manufactured in a lab. And yet, three weeks after that, the lab theory went mainstream. In an opinion piece in the Washington Post on April 14th, columnist Josh Rogan reported on a diplomatic cable in which American officials in Beijing expressed concerns about safety at the Wuhan lab, a serious shortage of appropriately trained technicians, for example. Rogan quoted officials who talked up the leak theory, and from there, it spread. But there is a growing belief that the COVID-19 virus originated in the Wuhan lab. U.S. intelligence officials tell CNN they are investigating another possible source, suggesting the virus possibly started in a Wuhan lab. The article by Josh Rogan in the Washington Post was a pretty traditional leak. He obtained some verified authentic State Department cables saying that an official visit to that institute had resulted in some security concerns. Those are facts. Facts always belong in the public space. I think what we're talking about is the context into which that article landed. You've got to understand that the US government uh, has its own interests here. And we know very well that the US State Department under pressure from Mike Pompeo is searching for a certain angle to criticize China. When the respectable press starts to report a story that's actually a fringe story, it brings it into the cultural mainstream. Then you have Trump, Pompeo and others go out there in public and repeat the right-wing talking points. Remember, China has a history of infecting the world and they have a history of running substandard laboratories. It is in danger of becoming a general cultural consensus. The absence of evidence on the Wuhan lab leak theory has led some US news outlets to push back against it, including the Washington Post itself. But the notion seems to have taken root. According to a poll conducted in May for The Economist magazine, 49% of Americans believe the virus probably or definitely originated in a Chinese laboratory. Then there is the fallout of this theory in China itself. In China, People have heard these absurd accusations from the U.S., and we think it is simply their way of shifting the blame for their disastrous handling of the epidemic onto us. From the start, this has been a one-sided, unjustified verbal onslaught. Stop. We should stop this meaningless war of words immediately and try to depoliticize the global fight against COVID-19, instead of constantly accusing one another. Chinese media clearly didn't get that memo. State news outlets have echoed government officials by insinuating that the virus originated not in China, but in the United States. There seemed to be also an interesting change of um, style in terms of the vocabularies and languages used by the state media. In a way, this is reaching a new level in terms of the assertiveness and aggressiveness um, in the kind of language being used to um, retaliate um, the, the, the accusation from, from the U.S. China's rise, economically, technologically, in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond, has presented the United States with a potential rival on the world stage for the first time since the fall of the Soviet Union. A growing information divide is just one sign of a new Cold War unfolding. Journalists have been caught in the crossfire. Chinese outlets in the United States have been made to register as agents of their government, while American reporters in China have been expelled 
But perhaps most significant is the growing schism between ordinary Chinese and Americans. A survey taken in April found that 77% of Americans blame China for the pandemic, and more than half think Beijing should pay reparations. As the headlines get more strident, the media commentary more aggressive, and as politicians on both sides see increasingly useful enemies in one another, the risk of a confrontation between two nuclear heavyweights grows. It's extremely dangerous uh, for two reasons. One, Mr. Trump and Pompeo, the two of them have been ramping up the rhetoric, and I think it's very dangerous on the one side. Secondly, the United States has brought an enormous amount of military hardware into the region and has uh, tested a hypersonic cruise missile which can strike anywhere in the planet in under an hour. You know, I'm not somebody who says, you know, let's run around our hairs on fire, but the United States rhetoric and the infrastructure of war that it's created could lead to a flashpoint. I very much fear that. I do think there is a risk that this period of intense emotional distrust between the two countries can crystallize into something more enduring. And that's something that both societies, both countries, both governments, in a sense, both media communities will have to address. When Beijing wants to take its message to the world, it has a state-funded English-language television news channel at its disposal, CGTN. Broadcasting in more than 100 countries, reaching 30 million homes in the U.S. alone, CGTN's stated aim is to bring a Chinese perspective to global news. But going global means that your journalism becomes subject to various local rules and regulations. And early last year, the American government compelled CGTN to register as a foreign agent in the U.S. We're going to get the CGTN side of the story now from Zhou Yue. He anchors the network's flagship talk show, Dialogue. Zhou is based in Beijing, but he brings an interesting perspective to the coronavirus story. He cut his teeth as a reporter working for Wuhan TV. In his current job, he's been known to take the foreign media to task for their coverage of China. Sober up. COVID-19 respects no national borders, no social bounds, no political systems, and no cultural values. It hits us just as hard, extreme, draconian, and aggressive. These are the words used to describe China's response. But now, people have come to terms with the new norm. Lockdown. Desperate times ask desperate measures. This is a desperate time. And we should not put politics ahead of public health. Now more than ever. Mr. Zhou, we just watched a CGTN video that you fronted in March on China's response to COVID-19. In that video, you said that we should not put politics ahead of public health. What was your intention in producing that piece? Well, the intention was, as you said, uh, to portray China's response to COVID-19. And I had an opinion that this issue has been too much politicized. And the politicization of a health issue, a global health issue, was not helpful for all human beings. That's why I want to explain what I think of China's experience, why did China did the way it did, and maybe the rest of the world should listen to what China has been doing uh, from the perspective of a Chinese coming from Wuhan. CGTN is a state-funded news network, not unlike Voice of America or RT from Russia, or indeed our network, Al Jazeera, which is owned by the government of Qatar. But your mission statement, which says explicitly that your aim is to bring a Chinese perspective to global news. At Al Jazeera, we're not out to bring a Qatari perspective to global news. So tell me, what should viewers take from that description? I don't believe Chinese perspective is a monolithic thing. Of course, every journalistic institution has its own philosophy. We are a Chinese media. Of course, many of our journalists are from China, and they have their own philosophical, historical, cultural backgrounds. That's, that's unavoidable. We still 
do journalism roughly the same, to tell the truth to the world. Of course, probably sometimes it doesn't sound and look exactly the same, but in the core, journalism practiced by Chinese journalists or British or American or Qatarian are basically the same. Because CGTN is an international news network, since your launch in 2016, you've been running into problems with certain overseas regulators. Britain, for instance, Ofcom, the media watchdog there, has criticized CGTN's coverage of the protest movement in Hong Kong, saying it broke its rules of impartiality. So what would you say to a regulator like Ofcom about that decision? Well, we have to obey the regulations and laws in different countries if you want to be an international broadcaster. That's the base, baseline for every broadcaster, I guess. But I don't think Ofcom's decision is 100% fair. But CGTN is a newcomer to the international broadcasting business. There is a learning curve, obviously. I think uh, CGTN is learning to operate their businesses in different countries, in different legal environments. CGTN seems to be spending more time than ever these days countering Western media narratives of human rights abuses in China. For instance, the mass incarceration of Muslims in the province of Xinjiang. Tell me specifically, what was it about that reporting that you take issue with? Mm, I cannot say... Um Western media in a broad stroke, but some of them did portray the Xinjiang problem or the Hong Kong problem. I think it is too biased or too narrow lens. They see everything in China happening uh, through their lens of their judgment, which is that uh, Xinjiang story is an incarceration of Muslims. The people here in China see what is happening in Xinjiang as efforts to contain terrorism from happening and bring economic stability and prosperity to the people. Yes, freedom were restricted and they were sent to training schools, but they were not incarcerated in the legal sense. And things have been blown out of proportion by some Western media. Uh, it has been skewed. and distort it in a way that the Chinese didn't think it is a fair treatment of the issue. But how is it skewing the coverage when the evidence that those reporters used came from official Chinese government documents, Mr. Zhou, that speak of, and I am quoting now, cleansing people's brains of religious thoughts? How do you skew something like that? That's why the problem is. You think it is the cleansing of minds of millions of people. Well, here we say it is basically education or messaging. I think those Muslims who are sent to the training schools are inclined to be extreme, and they need to listen to the other side of the argument. And what is, that is what's happening in those training centers. Of course, you can have arguments over all those kind of issues. What I really think it is not fair is that Western media believe they are morally superior, they are systematically better than the Chinese version. So the Chinese maybe sometimes feel they are lecturing on all the time, which is, shouldn't be the approach way of communicating. You broke into this business in the mid-1990s, then went to CGTN in 2003, and as you well know, that was a different time for Chinese journalism. The country was experimenting with greater freedom of the press. But those freedoms were then rolled back post-2008, after the Beijing Olympics were over, and then President Xi Jinping made it official, didn't he, when he said that Chinese journalists, their job was to reflect the interests of the Communist Party. So tell me, is the journalism that you're currently practicing what you would hope to be doing when you entered this field in the mid-90s and then went to CGTN? Uh, first of all, I'm a pragmatist. I'm always trying to do the best in the context. So um, like any country or any culture, it is evolving all the time. I don't believe I should be judgmental on where we are. 
but we should be adaptive and also learn to make the best out of the situation we now in. But I believe China, like the rest of the world, is moving ahead. Uh, I will keep a close watch and do my best to tell the story as it is, as I understand it. Zhou Yue of CGTN, thanks very much for speaking with us today. Thank you, Richard. This undeclared media war between China and the U.S. is not really a fair fight, because for every CGTN, there's a Fox News, a CNN, and MSNBC. For every Chinese paper, like the Global Times, the U.S. has a New York Times, a Washington Post, a Wall Street Journal. The other thing to consider is, for all of the flaws in contemporary American journalism, it does have a reputation for independent reporting that China's censored journalists lack. What the COVID-19 story needs is more on the science, less of the binary blame game on both sides. Because when nuclear powers are at odds, there are implications for us all. You've been watching a special edition of our program on the Sino-American News Divide. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.